Hello, this is Matthew, and welcome to part three, the final part in our video series on automating the installation of Linux on the mainframe under Hercules. I'm once again joined by Moshix, who I have been working with on this project. We are now fast forwarding a couple of weeks into the future after we had been experimenting and working collaboratively on and off uh, throughout the time since parts one and two of the video series were recorded. So we're happy to report that we have successfully automated the installation. And in this video, we will demonstrate the solution we came up with, walk you through all of the scripts, and show the process actually happening in Hercules, and then the Linux system that you'll be able to boot into after the installation finishes. So thanks so much for sticking around for all three parts of this video series. Hope you enjoy this one, and I hope you have fun using Linux in Hercules. So without further ado, let's get back into the videos. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Hi, Mish. It's doing well. It's uh, It's been about a week or so. It's been a week <laughs> or so, exactly. I was uh, traveling in the meantime, but uh, back here again. And uh, it's been uh, it's been an interesting uh, experience so far. Where are you with, uh, with this pre-seed thing? It has, yeah. So uh, luckily for the viewers, they'll have a little uh, just brief fast forward in time here and, and pick right back up where we left off. But uh, from the last time we were uh, recording together here, we had our Ubuntu pre-seed install going and we were just waiting for it to install all the software, hoping that we had answered all of the questions we needed in the pre-seed file. And yep. it probably won't surprise anyone that later in the install process, it did, in fact, ask us for an answer. Uh, and the installer just waited for us to provide that answer. Uh, so went just more a couple more iterations of what we were doing uh, in that last video where we were just seeing what questions it asked, looking in that other pre-seed file for the answer from before and uh, moving that into the new pre-seed file. And along the way, we hit one question that I couldn't figure out how to answer. So I went searching around a bit more and found uh, in the Ubuntu installation manual for the S390X distribution of Ubuntu specifically, they actually have a section for a sample S390X uh, pre-seed <laughs> file. And so that would have saved yeah. us, I mean, several hours of what we were doing last time. And then yeah. uh, after we had gone off, uh, off camera, off video to make the, the pre-seed file. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull that up in the browser now. Yeah. The problem of course, is that, you know, it, it, it can be like in the last, in the last few steps of the installation procedure, but it takes because it's emulated it can take like you know an hour until you get there and so every time we're going through the cycle of starting it letting it do the installation and then oh no after 90 minutes you realize there is still an interaction required so which is not which is not configured in the pre-seed and so we have to go fix that and then try again and so it's it's a time consuming uh, exercise <laughs> exactly and uh, if you're looking in this example S390X pre-seed, uh, we still were able to use some of the things that we had discovered and learned from last time. Uh, this file uses the QETH network type, uh, which I think is for the LCS um, yes. network device. And so since we're using the CTCI, which I think is just sort of easier to get set up with Hercules on Linux uh, with yep. that NAT setup we're using, uh, we already knew the right settings uh, for the CTCI, so we were able to put that into the sample file. Uh, and then a couple of other things that we had discovered last time ended up being really helpful to already know and not having to discover again. But this file certainly gets pretty close to the fully automated install that we're going after. Uh, interestingly, it still ended up asking us a couple of questions the first <laughs> time we ran through it. But again, we only had to do one more run through to see okay, what questions are left? And then it, it gave us a great starting point for what became uh, our our final pre-seed file here for our automated install. Yeah, so I, I'm looking at the at this web page now. And of course, yeah, it says here, uh, net device, choose network type, uh, string uh, QETH, which is LCS, um, exact, right? And yeah. uh, we're using CTC because uh, that just works better on Hercules. 
but yeah, so but this was still not the final one. That's what you're saying. So there there was still an interaction needed with the one they're providing here. Yeah, there were a couple of things. Uh, one that stands out in particular is that prompt about do you want to restart uh, services when libraries are replaced? That was still coming up. And yeah. even when we answered the generic library, uh, you know, service restart question is yes. It then specifically still always popped up about, do you want to restart after SSH is installed? So you'll see uh -huh. in, in our pre-seed file, uh, that's why in the end we ended up having the specific, uh, you know, yes, also restart after SSH is installed. So, uh, you know, still had to sit through a, a couple more of those couple hour cycles of install, wait to see what happens. But, uh, in the end we, we got there. So that, uh, that was our goal. How fast is the machine you were doing this on? I was doing it on a pretty fast machine. Uh, it ended up being about, I want to say maybe an hour and a half to do the full install. Actually, wow. I didn't really time it, uh, but yeah, it, it's a fast. It's a fast machine. It's like one generation old, uh, you know, i five. Uh, it's it's actually a, a machine I built specifically to run my various uh, mainframe and other emulations, and the machine I built to run my Z D and T emulator when I bought that from IBM. So I was just going for the fastest, uh, you know, per core performance chip that Intel had at the time. This was yeah. you know a year and a half, two years ago. So zippy machine, nice. which did make the process a little bit uh, a little bit nicer to wait through. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was uh, not. I was not at home or in the office, so yep. I was doing this on a cloud machine, which are not the fastest machines out there. And so it was when I was trying this, it was uh, more towards two or two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, luckily, you were you had a faster machine. So what do you what do you got now for the pre-c? Where are we now? Yeah, so let's switch back over to our terminal here, and uh, we can take a look at what we ended up with. So overall, it looks very similar to that uh, sample that we ended up using from the Ubuntu manual. You can mm -hmm. see here we have those CTC values instead of the LCS values, so it's the different yeah. read and write device. And that yeah. matches what we discovered last time, so that should look familiar. And then our IP configuration for how we're setting up the uh, IP tables rules and the IP addresses in the Hercules config that we saw last time. Yes. Uh, you'll see here we're creating a user, and this pre-seed, I've just left this placeholder value, yep. and the shell script that uh, is going to actually run all of this for users will ask for the password and then generate the encrypted password string to put in here. So we'll see how that works when we do the full install. Okay. And otherwise, uh, looks mostly like uh, what we'd expect, what we saw before. You can see here, this is where we're adding that DASD device to the system. So that's the hard drive we're installing on. Yes. And that'll match up with the Hercules device number. And we don't uh, use L LVM here, obviously. Yep, LVM. it's just a simple, uh, yeah, method, regular. So partitioning method is regular. So this is uh, yeah. just direct partitions that we then format as it'll end up being an EXT4 file system. Uh, yes. all of the files in one partition and we just say, yep, overwrite, overwrite everything, confirm, true, yes, we want to do it. Um, so definitely don't start this up on, <laughs> on a system that has a hard drive already, uh, with data on it that you want. It, <laughs> it will wipe out any, uh, any device at, uh, at, at address 120 here yes. uh, that's already on the system. On Hercules, yeah. On Hercules, yes. Uh, and then standard system, where it's on the OpenSSH server, so we'll be able to connect into it uh, just from Linux after it's installed. And then, I think that makes sense, right? I mean, um, it, it doesn't, you know, we want to have the bare minimum server environment so that people can then SSH into uh, the mainframe Linux instance and then install whatever they need. They can do an apt install GCC or or anything that needs you know, exactly it, yeah just uh but ssh obviously is, is required so people can ssh in and then do stuff exactly uh, now if you don't have the ssh server installed or if you somehow 
you know, need to get in and fix the networking or something like that, you are able to log in from the Hercules integrated console. You just need to remember to hit right. period before every, uh, yep. you know, every string you want to send into Linux. So certainly when I was setting some stuff up and experimenting, uh, that was just a quick way to directly interact with the Linux system. But of course, being able to SSH in is, is far preferable and is how you will normally work with the system. Right. And then here's those pesky questions that after, you know, getting through the hour and a half preliminary installing everything, it gets to the point <laughs> where it asks, oh, hey, do you want to restart, you know, services that uh, are linked against libc? And he was like, oh, why is it still asking that? But those, <laughs> uh, those take care of that. And then reboot in progress uh, note is just the thing that says, yes, you can go ahead and automatically into the installer shut down the system and try and reboot when the installer is all done right. uh, and so we've wrapped that all up in a shell script that that you'll see um, that just runs this whole process and uh, hercules ends up quitting cleanly when it's done so you're just ready to start hercules up into the newly installed system so you put this all together and now this pre-seed file is supplied to the installer uh, so that it runs fully automated through a full installation. And uh, I just tried this again just before we started recording this video uh, 30 minutes ago. And indeed, and I've tried it on several machines. I've tried it on Ubuntu of several versions. I've tried it on uh, Fedora, on Red Hat, uh, and some other Linux versions over the last couple of days. And so, yes, yeah, so I can confirm this just runs through on its own. And uh, it takes a while. It works a lot. You know, it, it has. There's a lot of work to do for Hercules there. And but at the end of the day, there's going to be a disk image with Ubuntu 18.04 installed on it that is bootable. Yeah, and the nice thing is because it's installing from the live Ubuntu uh, package repository mirror out on the internet. Whenever you run this to install it, you will get a fully patched, fully up to date Ubuntu 18.04 LTS system. Um, and because 18.04 was an LTS release, they are still actually releasing security patches for it. So you're getting an up to date patched Ubuntu 18 system. That's really nice. And, and I, you know, at, at this point, I think we need to say again, we said it early in the previous um, uh, installments of this mini series that we chose. Ubuntu 18.04, because that's the last version of Ubuntu that will run on current Hercules. Um, later versions of Ubuntu, such as 20.04, they require um, they require a later architecture, mainframe architecture, which Hercules does not currently emulate. So 18.04 is the one that this will install. And we, you know, and when people ask why why are you choosing something that's four years old well because that's all that runs on hercules right now having said that however i still work with 1804 every day i haven't none of my dozens of uh, linux instances both in you know um, machines at home and in the office uh, as well as in the cloud are anything later than 1804 i i haven't I've tried 2004 for a little bit, but I wasn't too happy with it. So it would be anyway, does you do it's anyway the Ubuntu that I like to run if I run Ubuntu. <laughs> Very convenient. Um, and again, right, if you wanted to run Debian or uh, Red Hat or one of the Red Hat derivatives or something like that under Hercules, you need to find a similar era uh, version of Debian or Red Hat that uses, uh, again, the earlier kernel versions that uh, didn't start relying on some newer Z architecture support that Hercules hasn't fully implemented yet. Right. And, and, and for people who come more from the Linux aspect to this video today rather than uh, from the mainframe, what, what is the reason for for this architectural thing? Well, uh, IBM keeps on adding new uh, instructions to their mainframes all the time. And they come, they, they, they have um, levels for these um, architectures, with, as, as they call them. And, uh, and so every two, three years, they introduce a new level, which has whole new instructions. And uh, for instance, that could be in the in the crypto space or the cryptography, or new I/O instructions, or support for new devices, etc. Compression is another set of uh, of instructions, and those obviously only go into uh, newer machines. 
and um, and uh, unfortunately, IBM has uh, reduced the excellent level of documentation they used to have in the past for this for these instructions, um, and it's becoming harder and harder, of course, to emulate those or sometimes even impossible. So that's why right now we're stuck with 1804. It doesn't mean we will, you know, that the Hercules developers, of which I am not one of those, but that the Hercules developers will not add those instructions later. It could well be, probably. But right now it's 1804. Yeah, and if you watch the Hercules mailing lists, uh, several of the developers there, uh, of course, Fish, sort of the lead uh, developer of SDL Hyperion and some of the other folks who help him. Uh, you know, there are active conversations about the transaction, the TXF type instruction support. Uh, there's, I think, some renewed interest in implementing some of the uh, vector instructions. So the Hercules community certainly has an interest in continuing to add the instructions and keep up, but the instructions keep getting more and more complex. And then also, like you said, they're less clearly documented in the principles of operations documents now by IBM. So it's uh, definitely a challenge for them, but they uh, they certainly still work on it. And I, I'm sure at some point we'll have, uh, you know, more and more new instructions that that reach the, the correct sort of implementation and, and matching behavior of the real hardware, which is pretty cool. Yeah, let's, we can only uh, hope and wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, uh, we have so much to play with. It's like you can spend a lifetime just playing with everything that's available currently. So uh, we don't need to be too greedy and, and try and add more to the plate. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have we know that this pre-seed that we just looked at works. It runs fully automated. And then on the base of that, what you, Matthew, and, and I put together is a way to have automate all that so that people would clone a repo, uh, start a small uh, bash, uh, well, not so small anymore, <laughs> but start a, a bash script that that runs through the whole and you know, starts Hercules. Uh, we provide the Hercules with the repo so that people don't even have to go and install the Hercules or find out where to get it. We just fully automate it. You start a script and let it run for a while. And then at the end of it, you will have a bootable Linux on the mainframe. And so we put this all together and uh, we call it the Z Linux uh, repo. And um, I'm gonna go and uh, put it up on my browser here. So, um, so this is the repo that you, Matthew, and I put together um, in, uh, in the cooperative remote uh, uh, work, and uh, and why don't we just uh, so the, the the address for this is uh, GitHub.com/slash/moshix/slash/zlinux, and again, even even though it says Moshix, it's actually done by both of us. And if anything, Matthew has done more than me on this, um, and uh, and it had it, it has a readme. And the README says that this is a collection of scripts um, that obtain an ISO image for Ubuntu 18.04, which, which is what we just talked about, for the S390 architecture, and then installs it on a fresh uh, 3390 virtual disk um, inside Hercules. And then um, once this runs through for 90 minutes to two hours, uh, depending on the speed of your machine, uh, we now can start it by just typing a script starting script called run the Linux and then SSHing into that instance. Um, so uh, it just fully automates the whole process so people don't have to figure out anything other than just cloning this repo and starting a script. And uh, we'll put the address of this repo in the description below the video you're watching right now. Um, but it's uh, quite uh, simple. So github.com slash moshix slash zlinux. And uh, everything else, I think we can do in the terminal, Matthew. Why don't we just clone it and show how this works today? Sounds good. All right. I have the URL here. So let's git clone that. And that should create a new Z Linux directory for us. So we'll yeah. go in there. I just had a discussion on. Uh, on Discord with somebody a couple of days ago, should tar files, um, and of course, this is a GitHub clone, it's not a tar file, yeah. but yeah. should tar files um, put everything in the directory or should they create the directory and put things into the directory? <laughs> they should always 
create a directory and have everything in the directory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but of course, uh, the uh, MVS um, TK4 um, distribution by Jurgen Winkelmann actually does what what the standard used to be, which is just put it in the directory you're in. And so if you if you unzip the um, TK4 distribution, you'll have like 16 five <laughs> yeah like if you just do it in your home directory or something yeah um yeah it's uh, i i get very upset whenever i download a tar file that does that it, it seems to be a difference i think between sort of a uh historical windows convention with zip files versus more of a unix convention where i think you tended to tar up a directory and so then the directory was restored Right. Um, but I, I, whenever I'm unzipping a zip file, I always make a new directory and go into that directory and unzip it in there. Cause I, I tend to expect zip files to, uh, to not have just a single directory in them with all the files inside of that. But on tar files, uh, I've gotten in the habit now of always doing a tar dash TF first, just to get the, the listing of files in a tar yes, file exactly. to, to confirm. But most of the time, um, they like unless the tar file was made maybe by more of a windows person uh yeah there there should always be a, a directory in there but always check before you untar something uh because you yeah you never know yeah so we got uh this cloned uh pretty uh fast i mean it's it's a small um it's yeah a it's just a few scripts uh, uh well not so small. it's 118 megabytes but oh yeah very good... i guess we're including hercules <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but exactly. The the reason why it's 118 megabytes is because we include uh, a full Hercules distribution with the script. So you don't need to have Hercules installed. It doesn't hurt if you have it, but um, we will uh, always execute the, um, you know, we will uh, boot uh, the Linux on Hercules with our own provided Hercules um, uh, version 4.4. .4 uh ourselves and th the reason for that we want to just talk you know a few seconds about that is that um a lot of people they install hercules with uh something like apt um apt uh install hercules right or yum install hercules on red hat and if you do that you get a version that's um can we see what version we will get what is the command for that i think uh, does apt cache give you or if you just say like apt uh, space search space Hercules, does that tell uh, you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you're right. Hercules. It, it'll tell us the package. It may not tell us the version. Oh, yeah, it does. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, it comes back with, um, where is it? Uh, it's about the third one down, Hercules yeah. 3.13. Yeah, 3 .13. yeah. Yeah. So if we, most people, if they install Hercules um, with, with the package manager, they get at best a 3.13, which is a very old, it works fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's a very old version of Hercules, which is um, unfortunately, I think, not able to run uh, Ubuntu 18.04. And uh, a lot of people don't wanna go and get Hercules and compile it themselves because it's a bigger program and requires a lot of uh, uh, dependencies to compile. So that's why to make life easy for everybody, and especially for those people who don't come from a mainframe or from a Hercules world, but just curious to see Linux on the mainframe, we provide our own Hercules. Now, this Hercules uh, has been compiled, uh, so it should be working with uh, most uh, uh, x86 64-bit platforms out there, whether AMD or Intel, older processors, newer processors. Uh, so we made this as... Uh, as safe to run on a, any uh, Intel uh, x86 64-bit um, processor that's out there. And we I've tested it on several machines. It's always worked fine. And uh, I think you tested it too, Matthew, right? Yep. Yeah, I've been, all of my test installs have been using our, uh, our included Hercules here because, again, that's our script always uses this Hercules. It won't use the Hercules from your path if you happen to have Hercules installed. Yep. And uh, you know, not really the the focus of this video, but for for folks who are interested, uh, we include the script here in the scripts directory that we use to build that Hercules distribution. So if you did want to build, you know, a different uh, version of of Hyperion. Um, or you know, for whatever reason you want to change something about it, uh, we do document here 
how we build it. Uh, also, interesting note here about including a relative run path, which is how binaries on Linux find the libraries they need. Uh, and we're doing this in a way because this, you know, this folder could exist anywhere uh, in your file system. Um, so if you're interested in how this is built, this is uh, exactly how the Hercules that's included in this repository uh, was built, including like like Moshex was saying, pretty generic, uh, just x a six sixty four generic tuning, so that it should run on any you know reasonably uh, current x a six sixty four system. And before people start uh, banging on the monitors, and we can hear you when you do that. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> people will point uh, to this. I'm quite sure ah, minus yeah. oh one. And why do we do minus optimization one, or you know, why do we give it this option? Why not three? Uh, the GCC compiler is quite an, it's quite good at optimizing. That is true. Um, it is able to do things where I'm really surprised that it even sometimes understands the intent of the programmer in doing certain things and replaces them sometimes with. Uh, with uh, with uh, macros that exist on the machine, so yes, it's true that the optimizer is is truly awesome and amazing for, with GCC. However, if we give it there anything higher than optimization one, it will start to use locally available instructions. Um, um, even when you tell it uh, architecture eighty six sixty four that make it um, crash on uh, on different kind of machines. So if, if I'm compiling this on a on a on a machine that's uh, from 2021 with several new instructions by Intel, and then try to run this uh, with an optimization level three on a machine that's maybe six uh, years old, it will crash. So op uh, optimization one is kind of required to make it compatible with everything out there that's x86-64. Yeah, no, you had tried originally a, a dash O2 uh, or even just the defaults that the uh, Hyperion configure script and make files use. And I think some early folks who were testing uh, ended up yeah, hitting some crashes. So this is this is what uh, seems to work safely across all the systems people have tried this on so far. Yeah, and, and luckily uh, Hercules is well written. So I've yeah. actually done a test uh, running this um, with O3 and then running with 01, and the difference was maybe uh, uh, between 120 MIPS and 126 MIPS. So it didn't make a huge difference. Yeah. All right, so we have this directory, which is uh, what people, what, what we expect the viewers to clone and uh, on their own computers. And then they have this, and um, it's really quite easy. People would, would write, would start it with uh, start, with Z Linux installed. So that's a script that installs um, uh, Ubuntu on, uh, on an emulated disk. And then once this is done, then there's another script, which is uh, run Z Linux, uh, which then starts the environment and uh, boots Linux on the, on the mainframe, and then you can SSH in. So it's really quite easy. And then there's just one more script here, the cleanup after successful install, which removes any ancillary files that uh, have been downloaded. So the Zilinux install bash, do, do we want to uh, explain what we're doing in the script, Matthew? Yeah, let's take a quick look. Uh, so we, oh, sorry. <laughs> Your controls. <laughs> All right, my controls. We can open it up here. And, uh, you know, over the last, week when Moshex and I have been working on this, we've we've gone through several iterations. So the change log is already quite big here, uh, kind of starting with some of the work that uh, Moshex, I think you originally did for the first TK Ubuntu distribution uh, yes. before deciding that we want to take a different approach here. Uh, yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of good background we had to start with here. And then I made some tweaks based on the new pre-seed setup that we had. Uh, and then it uh, looks like you've since gone back in and uh, made a few more cleanups and tweaks just to make it a little bit more uh, reliable and and clear to the users. Yep. Uh, so one of the things we're doing here is we actually don't run the whole script as sudo. Uh, you know, Hercules can run as a regular unprivileged user. And because Hercules sets up network interfaces with a separate Herc IFC program, we can just run the initial IP tables configuration as root with sudo and uh, we set the Herc IFC to be set UID 
uh, route. And that essentially lets most of this happen just as a regular user. So uh, if you try and run this with sudo or as root, we'll say, no, 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 really, you should just be running this as a regular user. And then we will uh, just use the sudo command to run a couple of commands during the process um, of installation. Uh, so it's broken up into several functions uh, just to do the various parts. Uh, we only support Linux right now. Um, uh, you know, Mac OS probably wouldn't be a huge stretch to also support uh, yeah. if we, you know, had a build of, you know, of, of Hyperion for it. But otherwise, you know, for the most part, the shell commands will work. Uh, Windows users, sorry, you're on your own. <laughs> uh we do some calculations for, you know, okay, how should we set up Hercules? How many CPUs should we give Hercules? How much RAM should we give Hercules? So you can look through there if you're interested. And uh, you can see here, based on that, we have a couple template files where we'll create the Hercules configuration file by replacing some placeholders with uh, the values that we calculated. Right. We have a little safety check here. Uh, if you run the installation script again, we don't want to just blow away and overwrite your uh you know your virtual dasd disk file that you just sat through an hour and a half or two hours uh, of installation uh to finish so you'll see some safety checks here in the script and uh then yeah then we just go through the steps so uh we check for running sudo we check the os we calculate the cores and ram to create the hercules configuration file uh, we add that Hercules location that we ship to the path so that when we run Hercules, that's a file we get. And then we just print out the nice messages for the user to see as we're going along. Uh, we asked how big you want us to make the DASD file. Uh, so we can create a 3390-3-9 or-27. Uh, note that we do create these as compressed uh, 64 bit DASD, so DASD in at 64 Z. So if you say 27 gig, you're not going to get a 27 gig file on your hard disk all of a sudden. You're going to get a very, very tiny file uh, because a DASD, uh, a CCKD full of nothing is just a very, very small file. And then as data gets written to it, it will be compressed. Uh, so even if you fill up your 27 gig virtual hard drive, uh, it's not going to be a 27 gig file on disk. Yeah, it's sparse files. And of course, yeah. they grow if there's stuff in it. Now, one thing that you probably, uh, I saw your your cursor was was hesitating for a second because um, because this is new to you, this line here. So I just added this yesterday. We do check if there is disk space before we create those. So we ah, I see, yes, strange, yes. Yeah, uh, so we don't have any strange um any strange error messages so um those are checked and um for of course we also need space for the for the virtual disk at its maximum capacity but of course we also need space for the iso image which is also about 680 megabytes so uh we run those that's that's new from yesterday matthew okay, yeah <laughs> i haven't seen that yet so that's, a, that's a nice check yep yeah okay so then all uh, right uh, so it creates the DASD, and then it goes, it, it, it asks for confirmation if you really want to download a, an ISO image that's quite big. And uh, if the user says yes, then it goes and gets the ISO image from Ubuntu, right? It's not from us. This comes straight from, from the Ubuntu folks from Canonical. And, uh, and then uh, once you get the image, if that was successful, so if there was no error, now comes this stage here, which um, you want to you want to run us through this. Yeah. So this, uh, if we actually look in scripts config precede, uh, this is what sets up the precede file. So we ask you for the password that you want to use for your uh, Zubuntu user. Uh, so you can see here it'll prompt. Uh, this will be the username after the system is complete. So you log in as users Ubuntu, right? Yep. And then you get to set the password. So we're not setting a default password for your system. 
And uh, one of the things in the pre-seed file is we are, uh, the pre-seed file does support putting in a plain text password, but then you have a password you entered sitting around in plain text, which you generally want to avoid. So OpenSSL has a feature to generate the Unix crypt style passwords. Uh, and then dash six is the current uh, standard scheme that most Linux distributions use by default now, which is a SHA-512 based hash for the password. Right. Uh, so we're able to ask OpenSSL to do that for us. We just get back the encrypted password, really the hashed password, um, as a variable in the script. And then we're able to drop that into that placeholder that we saw earlier in the pre-seed file to create the final pre-seed file that we'll actually use to do the install. So there's never a password written anywhere. So uh, yep. that's one more reason why we wanted to do this this way and not provide a ready installed uh, Ubuntu image, which is what I had attempted like a, two, three weeks ago. And then OpenSSL is nice because if there's, it'll prompt you twice. Um, so at this point, OpenSSL takes over, it prompts enter password and then enter password again. And if anything fails there, we just loop over that until we get a good value, a successful value out of OpenSSL. So if you mistype your password the second time, uh, it'll still be OpenSSL that then once again asks you uh, what's, you know, we'll run that again and say, no, try again, uh, type your passwords correctly. And now we're coming to the, where the, where the magician's uh, <laughs> tricks come in. Yeah, so this, in the previous installments, you saw us doing this manually each time. Uh, but essentially the way, uh, there are three ways you can provide a pre-seed file to the Ubuntu, really the Debian installer that Ubuntu uses. And for our purposes, the best way is to embed the pre-seed file in the initial RAM disk image that the Linux kernel loads uh, that has a bunch of the modules, the driver modules, but then it can also have this pre-seed file. So we, uh, we take the install slash boot directory in the Ubuntu install CD, which by now we have copied into this Z Linux directory um, from that git ISO step in the script. And we create a copy of the original as shipped in it RD, just so that if uh, if you run it again, we'll start with a clean copy automatically. And then we unzip the init RD. It's gzip compressed. We use CPIO to append our pre-seed file into that init RD, which is a CPIO format archive. And then we just gzip it back up and uh, move it over top of the original init RD Ubuntu. And then part of the way that the S390 boot process works for Linux is uh, this init RD.size file gets mapped to a known location in memory. And the Linux kernel knows to look in that location in memory to see how many bytes to read for the init RD file. In a hex. Uh, in a hex. So uh, we're just using a little trick here where we're using the uh, the XXD utility, which converts from hex. Uh, normally, you use it to view like a binary file in a hex dump format. But with the dash R, it goes in reverse. It converts a hex dump format back into a binary file. Uh, so we're just taking the size of that new init RD in bytes. Uh, and then this du command prints a couple of columns. So we're using awk to grab just the size value out of that. Uh, and then we're putting it in this little template of a hex dump format. So offset zero, and then a zero padded eight character long hex value. Uh, so that's what the printf command does here. It's just like printf and C, where you can say percent 08x as a format specifier. Yeah. All of that. Uh, will end up creating, after going through XXD in reverse, just a binary file on disk with uh, eight bytes that is the raw value of the size of the init RD. And that's what gets loaded into memory as part of the IPL process uh, of the Ubuntu installer. So that's what all of this, uh, this printf piped to awk, piped to XXD, 
saved out to the init rd size thing is so uh, again if you saw in our previous installments we did this kind of manually by hand with the calculator and editing the file and, and all of that but this is just a nice automated way to do it with a little shell one-liner <laughs> and now we have this fully automated so instead of having to get your calculator out we just let the computer do the work for you <laughs> Yeah, more reliable this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Far fewer typos as well. Uh, so if we go back to our install Zlinux uh, install script. Yep, so we uh, downloaded the ISO. And in fact, maybe we should look just very briefly in the scripts uh, Git ISO as well, because this is where we do the download, as you'd expect. We can use wgit or curl, uh, whichever one you have installed on the system. And we also will, uh, you know, if you've already downloaded it or if we download it for a previous run, we'll use the file that's already downloaded. Uh, but here's another place where we need to use sudo. We go ahead and mount the ISO and then we copy the contents of the installation ISO to our install directory uh, here in the zlinux folder. And so right. that's why we were able to edit that initrd file and all of that is because we've copied all of this to the hard drive so that we can make those modifications and then install from here. And yeah, and as our viewers can see, we try to put in as many sanity checks as possible in there through the process. So as we just said, we don't download the ISO image twice. We try to make sure we don't assume things to just function always and uh, that the commands are there and all those kind of things. Um, it, we will probably keep on working on this. Uh, this is now version 05 as of today, but we'll keep working on it and put more and more sanity checks in to make it as, uh, as uh, safe as possible to run and not get into any weird situations. But uh, we have, I have tested this myself extensively and it, it does work quite nicely. Yeah. And again, right, as more and more people use it, right, there's probably more different situations that we might not have thought of. So if you hit anything odd, you know, feel free to uh, ask in the mainframe enthusiast discord or open an issue up in the GitHub. And uh, again, our goal, the turnkey uh, in the name here really is to, uh, you know, make this as turnkey as possible. Folks should just be able to download this on an x86 Linux system, run the install script and everything should work flawlessly. Yep. Uh, so next, we're back in the main script here. We set up the networking. Uh, so this runs the IP tables set up for address translation and uh, all of that good stuff that, again, we saw in previous installments here. Uh, and we set up the Hercules interface configuration tool to run uh, with the set UID bit. Um, as root. So again, this is what allows us to run Hercules itself as your regular unprivileged user. And then Hercules just uses the elevated privileges of the Herc IFC program to create that tunnel interface that it uses to hook itself up to the Linux network stack. Yep. And I think just for safety, uh, yeah, we do end up removing the root owned Herc IFC uh, and then move back into place the original one, which will basically just be owned by whatever user um, cloned the Git repository, and it doesn't have the set UID bit. Uh, so, of course, there's a window of time here when you have a set UID uh, binary on your system, but that's just during the installation. And we do try and sort of clean up after ourselves there, so it's not just always sitting around on your system. Yep. Try to make this as safe as possible. Yep. All right, so the last thing we do is we automate Hercules itself with a Hercules RC file. And uh, this is just the file that tells Hercules when it starts up to run the IPL command. And we set up uh, some automations so that when Linux prints its lines to the console that indicates it's time to restart or shut down, uh, Hercules will stop uh, all the processors and uh, actually quit. It can't restart cleanly. so. Uh, it'll just quit back to the console and you'll be ready to run again. And after the installer, if everything went well, uh, we will um, move the normal 
what you call the runtime Hercules RC file. So not the IPL from the CD, but IPL from the DASD file into place. And then from then on out, you just use the run Z Linux script uh, to run your newly installed system. Yep. So uh, this is uh, only about uh, 311 lines. And uh, we've tried to make this as, as, as uh, you know, a situa situation aware as possible, what's on the system, what commands are there. Um, I'm sure that if, when people start using this on all kinds of distributions, all kinds of different environments, um, one or the other issue will come up. And as you said, Matthew, if you open up an issue on, uh, on our repository, uh, we'll be on it as quickly as we can. But for uh, at least for me, it's worked quite reliably. Yeah, me too. Uh, then there's just one more script, uh, which is a very simple script, which uh, um, is the script that users would use to, uh, st after the install was successful, to then start Ubuntu in the mainframe. Um, so that's this script. It's, uh, as you can see here, it's, it's only 159 lines, so much simpler script. All it does is um, it um, let's go to the main. It checks if the if there was indeed a successful install. So we don't assume it's just there. We do check. Sets up the Hercules environment, um, and uh, uh, and then sets up the network, which is the same we have. We also need during the install, obviously. Uh, sets up the networking, and uh, and then uh, we do the whole thing again with the setting the sticky bit on the uh, Hercules IFC um, uh, uh, binary, uh, and then we start Hercules with the uh, Hercules uh, RC file, the automation file um, that it, that allows it to run uh, boot Linux from the uh, newly created hard disk image or uh, 3390 that we created during the install. And so uh, that's all this script really does. It just automates the uh, using the supplied uh, Hercules and, and booting it up. Um, then we have obviously a logs directory where logs will be kept. Um, so any log, everything that happens uh, is logged extensively so that if there is any issue and people do open up issues on GitHub, uh, if by looking at the log files, we should be able to get uh, insightful information about the environment and why things are uh, failing. Uh, DASD, this is the one directory where you don't want to remove uh, because the hard disk file is going to end up in here. Um, and uh, what else do we have here? Um, the scripts uh, you just mentioned, Matthew, are in here to get the ISO to set the network configure the pre seed and how to build uh, Hyperion or Hercules. And um, and all the rest is really just GitHub related, such as version. So we just have an automated version. Um, this and security is for uh, security reporting. Uh, other than that, it's really uh, a very small uh, set of scripts and, uh, and templates. What do you think, Matthew? Should we give it a try and uh, show people how? I think we've made people wait long enough. Yeah, go ahead and kick off the <laughs> Z Linux install. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, after you would after you clone this directory from the repo, um, you end up exactly what's in here. So, uh, obviously, starting it like this um, requires um, us to provide the password. Yep. So again, you saw a couple places in the script, we do need to run commands with sudo. Um, so if you don't have a, a password set for your sudo, if it just runs automatically, this will all run through automatically. But if you uh, do have to enter your password for sudo, you'll of course be prompted for your password whenever we hit the first sudo command that we need to run. And then yeah. depending on what your password timeout is, right, it's possible that maybe later after the install is finished, it might prompt you for your sudo password again. So that, that just depends on your particular system's sudo configuration. Yeah, I think in my case, the sudo lasts uh, for three minutes. Um, so yep. of course, yep. during the install, um, the, you know, also the obtaining the, the ISO image, depending on the speed and the, of the internet connection could take 
uh, over three minutes and then you would have to put it in again. Yeah, the good news is once the long part of, uh, you know, once Hercules is up and running and the actual Linux for Z uh, install process begins, you can walk away and, you know, not worry about, you know, coming back and having to enter your sudo password again and then having to wait another hour or two hours for it to finish. Basically, the sudo prompts will just be right at the beginning of the process and then right at the very end of the process. So then once you start the script, uh, it goes and determines how many cores are present uh, on this system. Uh, this Linux that we're working on right now is actually a virtual uh, Linux itself. So we're running, uh, of course, several levels here, layers. But um, but it, it's, uh, it sees that we have six cores. And so therefore, it sets uh, Hercules to five, which is the way you should run Hercules. You should, uh, if you have 10 cores, then you should have your Hercules at most nine cores. Always leave one for the operating system to do its job. Uh, then it sees that this machine has 32 gigabytes of memory. Um, and so it sets a Hercules to eight gigabytes, which is more than enough to uh, run the installer and to also IPL a fully installed Ubuntu image. Um, I can't really think of a reason to run any more than eight gigabytes for for an emulated uh, Ubuntu on uh, on the on Hercules. Um, and so then um, we get with the, the whole installation procedure starts, and then we get to this point where it wants to know how big is the virtual or the emulated disk going to be. And as you showed in the script before, Matthew, we have three options, three gigabytes, nine or 27. I think uh, Ubuntu 18.04 just barely fits mm -hmm. in a three gigabyte disk image, isn't it? Yep, the install selections we have, so that uh, basic system utilities, OpenSSH, the base system, uh, does fit in three gigabytes. I think you end up with about 500 megabytes free <laughs> to play with <laughs> after that. Yeah, it's quite unbelievable how big uh, these distributions have become. But um, I keep in mind, it's also, I think, allocating some swap space and some other things as well in that three gigabytes. So, yeah. True. Yeah, the boot partition. Yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah. So three gigabytes will still work, and then nine or twenty-seven. And for people who are not coming from the mainframe world, there these numbers look arbitrary. But they're actually the the disk models that IBM provides or has been providing for the last thirty years are exactly like this. There's a one gigabyte disk image or disk drive that they used to offer, which of course is not cannot be used in our case, but there's a three gigabytes and nine, 27, and even a 54 gigabyte. Uh, and that's all they really have to this day. You cannot get a disk from IBM, a mainframe disk that's one terabyte that doesn't really exist. Uh, you always have to choose one of those and then work with those disk sizes um, as, uh, as volumes. So in our case, we would choose, I guess, three or? I uh, may as well do nine, so we have a little breathing room. Okay. Um, I mean, again, quite honestly, there's no reason not to do 27, probably, just because these are those CCKD files. So they'll yeah. only grow to the extent that you actually use them. Um, but just be aware that formatting the 27 gig initially takes longer because it's all right emulated. Okay. This isn't a super speedy <laughs> system we're building here. Uh, so we can just do a nine here uh, so that the format step doesn't doesn't take quite as long. Okay, so um, continue with 700 mega megabytes ISO download from Canonical from Ubuntu. So we would say yes here. Yep, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, it shows us the command it's executing. It's a wget because I have wget installed. If you don't have wget installed, it will try curl. If neither of those are installed, then uh, it will ask you to install either one of those. And yeah, so this machine in my office is actually on a, on a reasonable fast connection, especially at night. Uh, and that's it. So it already obtained the ISO image. So that's Ubuntu 18.04 uh, revision 5, uh, which is the latest one that's out there. And of course, the script now has determined that the, that the ISO uh, image is available and that the installation can continue. Um, so in the meantime, it already uh, because we still had our sudo privileges, it mounted that uh, this ISO image on uh, on the system and copied the contents to an install directory, 
uh, in our working directory now called install, um, which will be removed at the end, but it copied everything in there. And the reason we do that is because we need to uh, put in the password uh, that the user is now asked to type in. Uh, and so that's why we need to work with that in the whole script with that printf line that you just showed us before. Matthew requires that to be there. Yeah, even if we had a you know fixed password, uh, just getting that whole pre-seed file into the install CD requires us to have that writable version of the uh, installation media. So that's why we do some checks on uh, disk space because the ISO image is, is going to be in the directory that's 700 megabytes. Then the install directory itself is going to, of course, take another 700 megabytes again, plus the uh, potential maximum size of the installation on the on the hard disk of Ubuntu. So um, that's why we do check for space. So we give it a, a password here. It could be, I don't know, it, uh, Ubuntu. I will try to remember that. <laughs> yep, me too. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Encrypted password has been generated. Uh, now comes the next phase. It, the script finds out through which network interface card or NIC uh, this machine is primarily connected to the internet with what is a default NIC. And so it finds out that is this uh, ENS 160, which is standard uh, Ubuntu nomenclature for NIC, for NICs. Um, and so it's going to use this and set up NAT network address translation for this interface so that it can actually, through this interface, go out to the internet. And then when responses come back from those machines on the internet, the um, Linux firewall uh, knows to send those packages back to our Linux running on Hercules. Um, and of course, set up the tunnel for all this. So now that we've uh, that this has all been set up, um, we can just press Enter and uh, continue with the installation. Yep, so at this point, it launches Hercules. Uh, and because of that Hercules RC file we put in place, uh, that runs the IPL install ubuntu.ins command, which is how you start the installer off of the DVD. Um, you can also see a couple of commands up here, the Hercules automatic operator. Uh, and this is essentially how we are detecting inside of Hercules one of the last messages from the installer, uh, you know, which basically says finish the installation. We actually have Hercules run a shell command to create that uh, installation successful file and then quit Hercules. Uh, so the script picks up where it, where it, uh, leaves off. So now it's already off to the races and, uh, it's already in this couple of seconds already executed, uh, almost 4 billion instructions here, <laughs> uh, running at 49 MIPS, uh, MIPS means million instructions per second. As you can see, we had the script automatically configured five CPUs for this Hercules instance, and they're all quite busy, uh, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially during the first part of the installation process. Later on, the installation process, um, which is, I believe, uh, a Python application, so single threaded, will only use one CPU for the direct for the for ninety percent of the installation procedure. So uh, having a reasonably fast core is more important than have many cores for the installation procedure. However, once uh, that in Ubuntu has been installed on this disk here that we have on this, on this device, uh, uh, as you can see here, DAST uh, HD0.120, which is in the DASTY directory that we just saw. Once it's installed on that disk and you boot, um, of course, Linux is multi-threaded. And of course, the more cores you have and the more RAM you have, the more comfortably it will run. Uh, it can All this could be run with one CPU and I think a minimum of uh, one gigabyte of memory. But Ubuntu 18.04 struggles with anything less than four gigabytes. So uh, it can be done, but it, it's going to be a little bit slow. So it's running here now. It's executing the installation. And uh, as you can see, uh, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu installer throws some messages. It generated an SSH key. And um, it's now connecting to Canonical um, for the Ubuntu archive mirror so it can get the freshest set of binaries so that, as you said, Matthew, everything is fully patched. 
with the latest security and bug fixes. So um, it's doing that. It, it has uh, internet connectivity and it's now reaching out to Ubuntu. We can see that also uh, by seeing the number of IO operations on the channel to channel adapter here, which is the network interface that Linux inside Hercules uses. So you can see it's doing IO to, uh, to the network and it's sending out requests and it's getting uh, replies. And uh, it looks like it's getting more replies than requests, which is uh, which is a good thing. <laughs> so, yeah, ultimately, we should be downloading a lot more data than we're uploading. So those outbound packets will be things uh, like, you know, the requests and then the TCP ACK packets. Uh, but uh, again, these aren't, you know, these aren't byte counts. These are IO counts. So for every big packet we get in, we still send out one ACK packet at the TCP level. So the numbers will probably stay pretty similar. Uh, but of course, actual data transfer, we're, we're downloading quite a bit and not really uploading much. And as we can see at this point, also the number of IO or input output uh, operations on the hard disk here in this line here, A, is one. And that's because Hercules started and Ubuntu sensed the disk. So there was an, uh, one IO operation to sense the disk. Um, otherwise, it would probably complain and say, I cannot install Ubuntu if there's no hard disk. So that's a sanity check, but only one IO at this point. But once um, it starts um, uh, the partitioning and the formatting and then the copying of packages into this disk, this number will go up dramatically. Yeah. So I'm going to flip us back to the uh, console output here. At least I thought I was going to. There we go. Uh, yeah, so we can see. So it does make progress. You do get some, uh, you know, progress indication every ten percent of the current step that you're in. Uh, so it'll essentially go through loading additional components. Uh, then it will go through the disk formatting or the disk setup and formatting steps. Uh, and then I think it installs the base packages, and then it installs additional packages. So it's basically just split up into two. Uh, kind of two halves, the required stuff, and then the extra things you get for uh, things like the system utilities and OpenSSH and just the other software that all gets pulled in from that. Uh, and then it finishes the installation. Right. Maybe we can also uh, open up a, a, an additional pane or, or a different uh, session on Tmux yep. and show what's in the directory at this point. Yeah. So that's in our Zlinux, Zlinux directory. Uh, you can see that we have that install directory. So this is where we copied all of the files from that downloaded Ubuntu ISO, which is new. Uh, and if you actually look in boot, uh, this is our modified init RD, and then that backup of the original. Uh, and of course, init uh, d.size uh, should accurately reflect our new size. And we have our Hercules configuration file, right? This was generated from the template and it has the uh, number of CPUs and RAM inserted into it. And then the rest of this is just the same on every system. So it has our DASD, it has that network configuration with the private IP addresses that we assign on the Linux and the Z Linux side of things. Yeah. Uh, and we also have that Hercules.rc file. Uh, this is what we saw. Uh, essentially, the Hercules.rc file, these are just Hercules commands that get run as soon as Hercules launches. So we're running some Hercules automatic operator commands. This is Hercules' ability to watch the, uh, the console for messages and then run commands in response to them. So when we see finishing the installation print out from Linux on the Hercules console there, we will run the Hercules command sh, which tells Hercules to run a shell command, touch install success. And this file, it's just an empty file, but it's how the scripts determine that, yes, we have successfully gone through one of these installation processes. Uh, similarly, when we see the console say requesting system reboot, uh, this is a message from the Linux kernel. Uh, we see that we want Hercules to run the command quit 
force. And that just tells it don't wait for the CPUs to actually get into a, uh, you know, for all, in this case, five of the CPUs to get into stopped wait states, because that doesn't happen 100% reliably uh, with Linux, we've noticed in our testing. So we right. just say, you know, at this point, Linux has synced the disks, it's flushed everything to disk, it's safe to pull the power plug on the system. So from Hercules perspective, we just say, hey, quit and force means just quit right now. Uh, we really mean it. Uh, and we IPL the installer uh, to kick off the whole process. Yep. And after the installation finishes, you saw in the script, we'll copy a different RC file uh, into place here. And that's the RC file that actually handles just your normal running of uh, Ubuntu for, for Z architecture, which will have the... Um, the system reboot and also system power down handled and it will right. ipl from the dasd instead of the installer yeah and, uh and then in the dasd directory now of course we have um the um, the emulated hard dasd or hard drive for the for hercules where ubuntu is being on onto which ubuntu is being installed so it's HD zero and with uh, device address 120. And uh, that's right now only 10 kilobytes. So it's as uh, it's a sparse file, um, as we have said already a couple of times. And uh, but this will grow eventually as Ubuntu starts copying stuff, over, stuff on it. This will grow to about two and a half gigabytes by when everything is said and done. Yeah. And you can see here the various steps. So when we ran the DASD init program to create the DASD, uh, we have its standard output as well as its standard error output. So again, if you run into a problem where we couldn't create the DASD uh, between these two files, you'll be able to see what it tried to do, any errors it reported. Uh, we have the logs from the ISO download process. Uh, we have the currently running Hercules log. You have the log from the network uh, process where again we just record okay here's the interface that we detected and set up and uh, then from a couple of different runs of the uh, install script we have uh, some of the uh, we can take a look at for example the z linux uh, install scripts when we when we ran it and let's see our latest one here uh, yeah, so a couple of scripts here. I think I had uh, uh, one of the little bug fixes I made was I was to make it not create a new file for sort of every command it runs, but I may have only done that in one of the scripts, not all the scripts. So it might be something we look back at. Yeah, but um, so it, it it logs, so we should be able to do problem determination if yeah. there is an yeah. issue, and um, and then uh, once the whole uh, once the whole installation has finished, we have this cleanup after successful install bash script, which will clean up, uh, remove the install directory, uh, remove the ISO image that we downloaded, and set make sure that all the permissions are correct, um, so that you you free up some space there. Yeah, and that's optional for you to run. Uh, you're welcome to keep the install files and the ISO around. But if you do right, once you're done with the install, if you're happy with your system. Uh, you can free up that space by running the cleanup script. All right. So now if we switch back to Hercules uh, running the installer. Yeah, let's just next out this. Okay. okay, there's load additional components. So I think the next step, it'll do the drive uh, partitioning and formatting, and then it'll actually start installing software to it. Let's see what's happening on the disk. Yeah, still only one I.O. operation on this disk, so it hasn't really done the partitioning yet, but it should just about start doing it. As you can see, a lot of network activity to get all those packages and the description of those packages. Yeah, I think we're sort of between steps here. We've, we're have we at 100% of this loading additional components, and then I think the installer is just uh, sorting out what to do next, and we'll, we'll probably see the disk stuff pop up. Ah, here we go. So it's actually now... Yeah. Uh, so this is Linux saying formatting, and then you can see when we start writing data to the disk, Hercules itself is now starting up its own thread to handle that disk device. 
Uh, so that's what these extra little HHC messages are. Uh, are we see here about. IO operations going up. Um, yeah. And I'm sure if we now switch back to the disk, we should see, yeah, already, as you can see, it's yeah. now writing furiously on that, onto that emulated mainframe disk. Um, that's a 3390 type uh, disk that's been around. I think it was announced around, uh, was it around 91 or 92 when the 3390 was originally announced? Um, and uh, this format and this protocol, uh, this protocol has been around since then, and IBM never really changed that uh, again. They just made the drives larger. Um, of course, we should also say that IBM stopped actually making the actual physical drive yeah. long ago. Uh, all these drives are now even on a real mainframe. The drives are emulated on a on a SAN on a on a uh, on a on a on a storage device that emulates those disks. But of course, IBM has stopped making this the cabinets, uh, I think around 2002, 2003. Yeah, it's all sand storage now. And like you said, the 3390 was the last model of real mainframe DASD that IBM made. Uh, so at this point, it continues on as the model that is uh, just the standard emulated model for all CKD storage uh, on mainframes going forward. Um, but again, yeah, backed over fiber channel, uh, sans ibm ds 8000s is is pretty much what you'd see uh, you know next to your rack that is your uh, z architecture mainframe you'd have your rack that's your ibm ds 8000 or typically lots of racks that are your ibm ds 8000 uh san arrays right okay so uh, this is now going to run for at least another 90 minutes i think yep this will go for a while so uh, how do you feel about time traveling to the future and uh, seeing where we end up with all of this. Yeah. I always get nauseous right after I land in the future, but let's, let's <laughs> I, I think, I think we can uh, take the hit on our, uh, on our equilibrium uh, for the benefit of the viewers out there. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Well, welcome to the future. Welcome to the future. Matthew. <laughs> Through the magic of uh, YouTube video creator <laughs> secrets, we are now at the point where the installation is finished. So Hercules automatically quits. Uh, we're back at the Linux prompt. Uh, if your sudo requires a password, you may have been prompted to enter your sudo password one more time. Uh, and that, again, is just to set, uh, to get rid of that root owned and sticky bit version of Herc IFC. We use sudo to get rid of that so we can then just move the regular uh, unprivileged owned by the regular user Herc IFC back in place. Uh, and it's now telling us that we can run our system with run zlinux.bash. Yep, indeed. and. Uh... Uh, we can also just quickly have a look maybe around uh, what happened in here. So um, the hard drive is here. And as you can see, compressed, it's 167 megabytes. Or uh, 867, yep. Uh, yeah, 867. And, uh, and, and because we are compressing it, right? That doesn't mean that what Linux inside Hercules will see is still about two and a half gigabytes, but yeah. the compressed from the outside, um, it's 867 uh, megabytes. So it looks like everything is in there. And why don't we just follow the advice of the script and start it and see what happens? Yep, I think we're actually in our Linux directory still. Uh, I guess two other changes of note. We have this install success file. Um, leave this here. This is how the run script knows that, yes, you've installed it. It's also that little safety net so that if you accidentally run Zlinux install again, uh, it won't uh, automatically overwrite your hard drives and reinstall. It'll say, hey, it looks like you've already installed. Are you sure you want to do this? Um, and yep. the Hercules RC file we talked about, we've now moved the normal runtime Hercules RC in place. Um, so this automatically replies to the IPL prompt by saying to uh, select the default uh, operating system uh, so you don't have to wait the 10 seconds for the IPL menu to, to time out and show you the default. Right. And we also will catch uh, whenever Linux uh, requests a system reboot or 
a power off. Uh, there's a couple ways that we've seen it can request a reboot. Uh, this will actually quit Hercules, so you'll just be back at your Linux prompt, and then you can either run Linux again, or if you're done for the day, you can uh, obviously do other things. And then we IPL off the DASD uh, at address 120 instead of the install CD. Yep. Uh, well, would you like to do the honors? Uh, no, uh, please go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> be my guest. Let's do it then. We will run Z Linux. And, uh, yep, there we go. So you saw it did run the network setup again. Uh, cause again, you might have rebooted your host Linux box at this point and cleared out those IP table rules. So the run Z Linux script will use sudo to run that network setup, uh, for you. And then you can see it went ahead and it's already IPL'd from our, uh, DASD and it selected the default uh, Ubuntu boot option for us because of that Hercules automatic operator command in the RC file. Uh, and yeah, already here's the Linux kernel starting up. These are already familiar uh, boot messages for any person doing Linux. As you can see here, the MIPS rate is uh, it's, it's working uh, hard and the IO rate is mostly reading, of course, right now. Uh, we can also look into those devices we can see all four five cpus are quite busy um <coughs> excuse me already over 3000 ios on the disk and only sensed that the nix at this point hasn't done much other than just sensing them so that's all nominal and look what we got here yeah it's already oh. started up so uh that's ubuntu with a login prompt uh as this i mentioned much longer than about oh. 10 seconds right i mean 10 12 13 seconds? Uh, yeah, maybe a little longer than that, but I mean, certainly under a minute. It was like, yeah, what, 30 seconds or so? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, right. It's, the emulated performance is actually interesting in a lot of ways. There are a lot of things that feel pretty quick and responsive, right? It's only if you get into heavy you know, CPU crunching or a lot of IO that you start to really feel the overhead of the emulation. But yeah. uh, sort of a testament to, you know, A, the speed of our, you know, real underlying, uh, you know, Intel and AMD processors now, but also uh, just, you know, Hercules as a piece of software, uh, you know, over the years, obviously, there's been a focus on, can we make this go fast? And it, it works really well. Yeah, it does. Uh, so like we talked about earlier, you can interact with the Linux console here from Hercules by putting a dot in front of any, uh, you know, command you want to log in as. If we wanted to log in as the Zubuntu user, I'd type dot Zubuntu, and that would get passed through to the login prompt. And then I'd say dot, and I'd enter my password, uh, and that would get passed through. But because we set up networking and because we installed SSH, it's much better to just use another uh, terminal window. In this case, we'll open another Tmux tab here. Right. And you're able to SSH into your system. So we created that Zubuntu user with whatever password you chose during uh, the install script. And the Linux system is available from your host Linux system as 10.1.1.2. That's its IP address uh, that you're able to get to it. Now, you won't be able to get to this address from other machines on your network. Um, this is just a local IP address between your host Linux system and the Hercules Linux system. Uh, using that IP tunnel interface that Hercules sets up. That's a good point. So um, there is a ways, of course, to make the Zubuntu available to machine other machines in the in the LAN in the network by using I, what I use personally is SoCat. I don't know if you know uh, this. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, SoCat is is kind of like the NC command, but it's forwarding. So you can say that anything that comes on port, let's say 1023 or 1022, I want to forward to the IP address of uh, of uh, of this uh, of of Ubuntu on the mainframe, and that works nicely as well. Yeah, and if you do know you know how to use IP tables and how to set up forwarding rules and IP tables, you could extend the yeah. network address translation setup that gets set up automatically. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, for most users, and if you just want to do something quickly, that that SoCat route uh, is much quicker and easier. <laughs> not not having to mess with all the IP table stuff. So now we're in. Uh, yeah, we're in Ubuntu on the mainframe. Uh, 
I was going to say you name dash a, you can see that. <laughs> yeah, same thing. You can see we are in fact running the S three ninety X distribution of uh, the Linux kernel. And if we do my controls, if I yep. do um, this, uh, it will come back with and tell us it's Ubuntu 1804 LTS. Um, so it's just a normal Ubuntu. It's just a normal Linux. It's only in certain places you see and feel that it's a little bit different. Um, I wonder if we can show that network is working, Matthew, by doing an app install HTOP. I don't Certainly. think it's installed by default. Uh, that was our password. Obviously, speaking of performance, as you said, uh, it's not just across the board, just much slower. Of course, it is slower, but certain things are faster than our other. So certain emulated functions are faster than other emulated functions. Um, I think that um, everything that's complex, um, such as cryptography, generating SSH keys, is considerably slower. I've noticed that. I don't know mm -hmm. if you saw that too. Um, actually, I/O is not that slow, I and mean, it's you can you can do real work with this. Um, it is obviously, I would say, compared to the host machine onto which uh, Hercules and this underlying Linux are running, it's maybe a factor of one to a hundred slower. Um, so, but you could do, you can do real work. So we have HTOP. Yeah, we got HTOP there. We can run that. Um, so that downloaded over the internet, the networking is working. Uh, yeah, and right, I agree. It's, it's very variable in terms of how much of a hit you'll feel performance wise for emulation. Uh, right, again, if, if it's a, if it's a heavy CPU load, then, uh, you know, a very CPU intensive task like encryption activities, key generation activities, or right, if you if you run a CPU benchmark program, that's where you're taking the big hit of of every single Z architecture emulated instruction, you know, gets turned into probably however many functions, uh, you know, that uh, that the C code in Hercules gets compiled to run. Uh, and so that's a big slowdown. But if you think about real world workloads, you're waiting for data to be read from disk. You're waiting for data to be read over the network. So while that IO activity is happening, the CPU emulation can kind of catch up with, uh, you know, those other kind of weight states that you're in. Uh, so that overall, you know, certain things can feel uh, like they're, they're moving along reasonably well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, where do we see that this is now running on a mainframe, right? And and this Ubuntu on a real iron mainframe uh, IBM from IBM, you know, a, a $5 million or $10 million mainframe from IBM would work exactly the same. Uh, but where do we see that this is slightly different? Uh, and so uh, the, what I like to show is always when we compile a program, and ask GCC to also give us the assembler output, uh, we can see that the assembler, of course, is completely different. Um, so I'm installing GCC here just to, to do this thing. And of course, you can, you know, the, the Ubuntu package manager knows that this is S390X, as you can see here, but everything else exists. So uh, it's the exact same distribution just compiled for a different architecture. Yep. So oh, it um, looks like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it looks like we got an error here. One of these packages wasn't in the archive. You might need to do a app update just to have it refresh from this mirror one more uh, time. Yeah. yeah, I think we should have done it, obviously. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then try the install again and, uh, yeah. They may have just changed this package out recently. Yeah. What version is it? 4.15? Libc dev 4.15, 188.199. I bet we'll be up to like 188.200. <laughs> Maybe some yeah, will like secure yeah. your bug fix that they just uh, were able to fish out. 
Yeah, I've had this happen to me too when I go and start installing things right after installing on, a, on a, an Intel machine without first doing the app update. I uh, should always do first the app update. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is one of those moments where it's, you know, working <laughs> on... Uh, Working on something. I wonder if we can see if we look over in. Uh... Yeah, right. So yeah, it's are... hi, right? So it's yeah. So when we're into a single threaded process that's just pegging the CPU, this is where you're going to feel the emulation slow down, uh, just because yeah. you can only emulate all these instructions yeah. so fast. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, it's confabulating stuff. And, uh, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> with, with the turbo encabulator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but it's good. Uh, we see this. I mean, this also gives uh, our viewers a feel for how this all works, right? Yeah. Um, you do feel that it's running on an emulator. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, as you said, it's quite to me, it's quite miraculous that we can run a full Ubuntu on an emulated mainframe and everything works, yeah, the network and everything else just fine. And uh, and the process is not that different from installing Ubuntu on a new real iron mainframe onto something like ZVM, it would be very, very similar. Yeah, it's very similar, right? You take that installation archive, um, and I think you basically make those files available on a CMS mini disk. Yes. Uh, and then you tell, uh, you know, in your ZVM uh, user or VM, uh, you tell it to then IPL from, uh, or, or you probably read the boot file from your CMS mini disk into your virtual card reader spooled to yourself. And then exactly. you tell you yes. your VM to then IPL off of that card reader. And that's yeah. where it loads that uh, Ubuntu kernel, uh, exactly. which then has the location of where to find the init RD um, from yeah. the parameters. Like you, you just kind of stack them all on the reader together. Uh, yeah. And then from there, it's it's the same. You're in the Ubuntu installer, and you could have put a pre-seed file into it and, and all of that. Yeah, most people do pre-seed on the mainframe because yeah. uh, interacting with uh, with uh, with the installer is going to be very, very similarly uh, awkward as it is on the Hercules. You have to, <laughs> yeah. you have to pass commands to the virtual machine. So it would be a very similar experience to running this on, uh, on Hercules, the way that you want to, as quickly as possible, get network uh, up and running so that, um, oh yeah, it's 200 as you, you can see here. Yep. It's not yeah, we went from 189.199 to 189.200. Yeah, so on the real iron also, you want to get to a, a, an SSH as quickly as possible so you can continue all the work there. Okay, binatils, obviously there's a lot of stuff lacking on this um, bare bones installation. So that has to go get binatils, the, the linker, the assembler, uh, the compiler and uh, a lot of you know, I say ISL, MPC, MPFR, and GMP are the libraries that GCC uses to um, do math. math uh, yeah. Well, so actually, that's so GMP, MPFR, and MPC are the libraries GCC uses to do math, and then ISL is a library it uses to implement uh, what's called the graphite loop optimizations. So uh, yeah. that's that's used during the the optimization step. Yep. Get a bunch of libraries here. Yep. I have spent way too much of my life building uh, GCC uh, from source, bootstrapping it on various uh, interesting systems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very, very familiar with the GCC build process and its prerequisites. <laughs> you had mentioned that you went on, I think, AIX or was it HP Unix from just the normal provided ANSI C compiler all the way to GCC five or six or seven? Uh, yep. Uh, and, and on AIX, if you have IBM XLC, but no GCC installed, you can bootstrap your way up to uh, even the latest and greatest on my Spark T4. Uh, from the Sun uh -huh. Studio compiler, I have GCC 
12.1 with uh, GCC Go support um, on Solaris for Spark, which is nice because the Go project doesn't support uh, doesn't support Spark, but GCC yes. Go does. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun. And, and just in fact, a couple a couple days ago, while you were traveling uh, between these video recordings, I uh, I have a Solaris eight system with the old sun workshop compiler which is just oh a, yeah I remember those yes c89 yeah uh you know nothing after c89 compiler and was able to get up to gcc 4.6.4 which i think is pretty much the end of the road for solaris 8 but uh, <laughs> emulated or on a real machine uh, on a real machine and how long did it take to compile gcc uh, so the real machine is actually the Spark T4, um, and I have that in an LPAR with, uh, I think 16 cores. So that, uh, that only takes about an hour. Oh, um, okay. now I, if I pull out my Spark Station 20 and install Solaris 8 and do that same thing, that will take the better part of a day, if not longer. <laughs> yeah. I, I compiled JCC, JCC 7.5, which is very similar to the one we have here, mm -hmm. um, on on um, on Ubuntu, on Hercules, on an Intel Nook <laughs> i7, and it took about 45 hours. Yep, that sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, it's it's both. It's impressive how fast that is, given the conditions you were running it under, but it's also a very large piece of software. Yeah. And I, since we have the instruction counter in Hercules, if you switch. Oh yeah, side, you can see. Yeah. Uh, Want me to switch back over? Yeah. Um, here, at the bottom, yep. you can see here yep. instruction count. So we are fifty billion here for um, at this point. But to compile GCC seven point five, I got to thirty five trillion. I was going to say, I'm sure you're in many, many trillions. Yeah, thirty five <laughs> trillion instructions. Um, um over 45 hours and i calculated that if it was one instruction per second um it would take one million years <laughs> so it's it's a quite quite an astounding amount of operations that goes in compiling gcc oh there you go yeah yep, yep. uh argv so yeah, we can say uh, hello, Z Linux. Yeah. And uh, return zero. That's it. So yeah, so if we, uh, of course, if we just build it regularly, we can minus s uh, prove that it works. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. But then yeah. we can ask for the assembler output, and if we look at ctest dot. S, we will see something that looks very, very different from the x86 instructions that uh, you may be familiar with. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously, this is GNU assembler notation, not uh, IBM assembler notation. So uh, even for diehard assembler <laughs> coders on the mainframe, this will still look weird. <laughs> I would say it looks weird to everyone. There's nobody who would look at this and think it looks like something normal to them. <laughs> Yeah, because there's the AT and T assembly notation that yeah. is, yeah. But um, but as you can see here, um, it's really at the end it's all the same. But uh, uh, it's setting up some um, some variables, right? Uh, that's a variable here, LC zero. Um, obviously, on the mainframe um, uh, uh, architecture alignment of uh, of variables is still important <clears throat> and instructions um uh, it's gotten a lot better with uh with the last 20 years with uh, newer uh, circuits on the mainframe but uh, uh alignment is still something that's important but um as you can see here those are all um uh assembler instructions and um and you can see also see that this is all written for 64-bit because we have this um, this LG um, in front of the so this was the original uh, assembly instruction. Then when you have LG, um, that means G stands for Grandi, which is 64 bit. Uh, so those are the uh, assembly instructions on the mainframe. There we can see that this is all compiling into a 64 bit 
executable. Um, and uh, and in the end, we have, of course, branch register uh, four, uh, which is the very final instruction that returns back to the to the operating system uh, out of main. So um, this is very typical assembler. We, you wouldn't do it much different if you were running on ZOS. Um, the register conventions are a little bit different there, but other than that, it's very similar. Yeah, so yeah, the calling conventions are different in Linux. And you know, you're talking about sort of the layout um, at the beginning here with you know these constants being in a text section. Uh, you know, that the other big difference between you know, say Linux on the mainframe and ZOS or ZVM is Linux on all the platforms it supports, it uses the ELF uh format for binaries and, and libraries, yes. right? The executable and linkable format. So it has uh, you know, different segments for constant data, you know, those kinds of things. Or if you were writing this in assembly uh, under, uh, you know, MVS under ZOS or something, you probably wouldn't have different sections that would be linked in differently. You would just have a section down here, which, uh, you know, would have your your DC and DS uh, assembly instructions to reserve the memory and then just bake that information into uh, a section that way. So right. a little bit different in terms of the actual object uh, formats that are used. It is the Linux format, not the kind of traditional mainframe format. But of course, the actual CPU instructions, these will all look familiar to anyone who's ever done any mainframe assembler. Yeah, I mean, on, on, the, on, the, on ZOS or... Um, or... You know, on, on the mainframe, you would have basically only two sections. Uh, you can go by with just one. Um, yeah. You can have, you know, the code section, the data section. But for such a small program, you would only have, you didn't even have a uh, data section. You would just put it all into the, into the same uh, uh, object section. Yeah. But yeah, that's it. I mean, this is uh, this is as much <laughs> as mainframe stuff as you will see. You really have to go look for it. Otherwise, it just... Uh, behaves and feels just like any other uh, uh, Linux. There are some special mainframe related instructions. Uh, I think it's this one's. Uh, yeah, chz dev. Uh, so that's a mainframe specific device management. Yeah, uh, uh, there's a couple of those. Utility uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think I don't know if you have VMCP. That's a fascinating uh, ah, nice. program. Uh, that's a program that finds out if Ubuntu is running under the mainframe hypervisor called ZVM, and if it is, it can communicate with the with the hypervisor, and you can you can do all kinds of funny uh, and, and interesting things. But of yeah. course, here uh, VMCP is not going to do anything because uh, VMCP uh, CPQN um, uh, there is no VMCP device, so that uh, between between Ubuntu and uh, ZVM, so it's not going to work. Yeah. Great. Well, that's it. Uh, I think maybe the last thing we can just show here is if you shut down. Yep. Uh, so again, like any other Linux system, right? You don't just want to go over to to Hercules and you know quit. You actually do want to shut down your system. Uh, so you just shut it down like you would normally shut down Linux. Uh, we did yep. it over that SSH session, so we got disconnected from SSH here. But if we go back to Hercules, you can see that uh, Linux actually shut down pretty quickly there. Very, quick. Very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, Hercules then quit. And just like in the installer, we do uh, reset that Herc IFC uh, binary to the non-root owned, non-sticky bit version. So we have to use sudo to do that. Um, so that's why here, after we've quit, it's actually asking you for your sudo password. And we do that for security reasons. You don't want to have uh, a sticky bit uh, program lying around that yeah. people can yeah. use for. Uh, so if you want to enter that password, please, Moshe. Oh. Sorry. Oh, no worries. There we are. And so now we're back to the prompt. We're shut down. Uh, and of course, next time you want to run your Z Linux system, you just run Z Linux again. And if you don't want that ISO image, uh, you know, around, if you want to remove install, you can either do yep. it manually, yep. just remove 
install and then remember to unmount the uh, DVD or the ISO image. Yeah, the yeah. installer script should have unmounted it for you as soon as it was done. Yeah. Um, uh, it yeah. actually mounts it on a temp directory, but uh, just in case it doesn't, uh, I, th I think the cleanup script may even do that for you just in yeah, case. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, think if so. you search for you. Uh, no. Oh, maybe we, maybe we don't we, we, because I, yeah, I probably, right. yeah, I took that out because the install script does it. Yeah. So, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, so I guess once again, if we just look over at the, I'm going to switch my browser window here. So uh, if you fast forward to the end, the TLDR is clone this repository <laughs> and then run the zlinux install.bash script out of it. And a couple hours later, you will end up with a uh, Ubuntu 1804 system installed under Hercules that you can run with the run zlinux.bash script. Yeah. Uh, so we also cover uh, in the repository, we mentioned why it's Ubuntu 18.04. We, we said that here during today's yeah. session. And uh, I think that's about it. Yeah, I think that covers it. It's been a fun project to work on. Uh, again, you know, we saw in the video series here kind of iterating over, you know, how to get the uh the pre-seed automation working and then it's right been interesting just kind of making these scripts to be uh, you know user friendly checking for a lot of conditions but also just wrap this all up in a nice uh, all-in-one turnkey process yep uh i i had a lot of fun doing this with you it was a natural cooperation we i think we think about things uh, similarly, I, I think the only difference that I could see is that you do shell scripting and I do bash scripting. <laughs> <laughs> I I do try to stick to um, POSIX standard shell. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things that are a lot easier to do if you're willing to accept a couple of bashisms. So for practicality's sake, given that, you know, especially since we're just targeting x86 Linux, we can pretty much assume bash will be there. So uh, I'm fine with some bashisms uh, where it makes the scripting easier. But yeah, you, you probably did notice in, in a lot of the stuff that I was writing, I, I tend to be a little bit stricter uh, standard yeah. shell scripting. Because again, right, just you know, my hobby is playing on so many different platforms, so many different operating systems, old operating systems. I'm just in the habit of, if it doesn't work in plain SH, uh, it probably doesn't work on one or more of my systems. Yeah. Well, one of the first things I do when I get on a on an unknown platform such as uh, uh, ZOSS, ZOS, mm. uh, USS, or or I don't know, uh, HP Unix or stuff like that is try to get bash as quickly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, even for instance, the shell that's provided with Z uh, at least was provided with ZOS up until maybe two, three years ago, uh, did not have um, uh, autocomplete. Oh, yeah, no, it still doesn't have tab completion. It doesn't have up arrow Absolutely. history, all those things. So, yeah, so, you know, for an interactive shell, yeah, I, I try and get ZSH, you know, as quickly as possible on any system I'm on. But then just for actually writing scripts, uh, uh, of course, I never assume that that anything other than SH is available. But oh, so you're a Z, you're a Z shell I'm, person? I'm one of those people. I'm a Z shell person. Yep. Uh, okay. I'm trying to switch to Z shell <laughs> uh, because my Mac OS is, you know... It, I was yeah, they switched to ZSH by default quite a while ago. Yeah, and I, I recently moved from uh, High Sierra to the latest version of uh, Mac OS, I don't know, Monterey, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, you can still get, Bash is still there, but it's an old version because Bash uh, switched from GPL2 to GPL3, and Apple didn't want to use GPL3, so they yeah. stuck with an old Bash. And uh, and I tried to go with Z shell. I'm trying as uh, you know. Th these days I'm working. On <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been using ZSH pretty much exclusively as my interactive shell since about 2001. <laughs> so, oh wow! <laughs> um, it's uh, you know again get you know get completion set up the way you want and everything. But I find it's it's completion. Uh, you know even you know since 2001, since I first switched to ZSH bash. Uh, you know, has gotten much better in terms of completion and and all of that, but it still just doesn't it doesn't feel right. It doesn't work quite as well um, <laughs> as ZSH. But anyway, you know, it's it's so much just what's in your muscle memory and what you expect and exactly uh, and all of that. So it, it can certainly be hard to switch a tool that you use every day, day in and day out. Uh, you you definitely go through a period of of adjustment. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, this has been a lot of fun. I, I want to thank you, Matthew, uh, for uh, doing this uh, together with me. I, uh, I had fun doing this uh, mini series. It, yeah, me too. Thank you. It works. So I think mission accomplished. And I hope that uh, people will start using this and they're going to have fun exploring the mainframe from a platform which they know well, which is Linux. And, uh, and for uh, anything else, uh, uh, post uh, problems on the GitHub page or join us on the Discord channel. And we will post uh, links to both um, the GitHub repository that we're looking at here, as well as the Discord channel in the description below this video. You just uh, go there and you'll find those links. And uh, there is, a, there is a, a vibrant community on Discord. We're discussing all kinds of mainframe and, and uh, other um, uh, retro computing uh, uh, topics. Uh, nice people out there. And, uh, and thank you for watching. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Moshix. And thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh, we look forward to hearing your stories about using Linux on the mainframe. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And that's it. You have made it to the end of the video series. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed seeing that process come together in the last couple of videos and the finished product with all the scripts and automation in this final part of the series. And thank you, Moshix, once again, for inviting me to work with him on this. Be sure to check out his channel, although I'm sure you already do. There'll be a link in the description. And if you want to talk with like-minded nerds about all of this mainframe, vintage computing, uh, Linux on Z stuff, you can join us over in the Mainframe Enthusiast Discord. Once again, the link is down below. Thank you, and see you next time.